This is your coffee break. Hi friends, I am back again this week with a very special guest. We have on today's show Vanessa Blakesley, who is publishing a novel for the first time. It's called Hooventude. Before we dive in too far to the wonderful intricacies of your novel, I'd love to have you just tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, certainly. And thank you so much for having me on, Sarah. I'm just delighted to speak with you. I am from Florida, not originally. Um, I was born and raised in Pennsylvania, but I've lived in Florida now for 18 years, a little town called Maitland, which is in the suburbs of Orlando, so northern, northern Orlando. And I've been writing my whole life. I started writing when I was probably six years old, stories, you know, in, in school and out and um, pretty much always knew I wanted to be a writer and then began taking workshops in college, went on to get my MFA at a wonderful low residency program, Vermont College uh, of Fine Arts, MFA in writing, and uh, began this novel in about 2009 and was simultaneously working on it with my first collection of short stories, which is titled Train Shots, which came out last year by Borough Press. So I would, you know, work on a draft of the novel, set that aside for a couple of months, work on short stories back and forth. And so you know, that really took up this time span of about five years from post, I guess my post MFA years. (laughs) And in between that, I have done everything from, you know, bartending to adjunct teaching of composition and creative writing to um, just the typical jobs, I guess, that, that we all do to support ourselves in this crazy venture of being in the arts. <laughs> yes. So I'm really thrilled to be here. It's a wonderful and surreal thing, as I mentioned just before we started, to have a project that you've worked on for five or six years finally become a, a real thing. So what about this is, is most exciting to you? Is it seeing like the physical copy of the book? Is it looking at the cover art? Is it going to a store and seeing your book on the shelves? What's the most exciting part about this for you? I think it's the part, the magical part where this story, really this living daydream that that's kind of how I think of fiction as these daydreams that we just work on and sculpt for such a long time. Um, other people reading it. So not so much the book as the physical object. And that's really a funny thing to think about because I think, you know, certainly when we're, I don't know, when we're not published yet, you think about that physical book. But I think for me, more of, more lies in the connection of p- this story that has lived in your mind so vividly now being transported into the minds of other people and to see their reactions. And it's really incredible. I love that. I love that. I love the idea of it being sort of an exchange of the minds, a meeting of the minds. You know, you've, you've imagined this setting so beautifully and I can imagine, I've never, I've never been to Columbia, but I can imagine exactly what you were, well, maybe exactly what you were (laughs) Thank you. Yes. Well, and I've never been to Columbia either. I will add that although I have written this novel that is set in Santiago de Cali, so that's southern Colombia, um, in the you know uh, near the Pacific and in the Andean region, I have lived in Costa Rica. Um, but a different turn of events in life had taken me there. I was dating someone who got it was working down there and um which is a whole another story in itself um (laughs) but uh so I don't know that had I not lived in Latin America for you know brief but pretty intense period of time and traveled around that I would have been able to simply capture the culture and the food, the topography um, of that, and certainly the the um, presence of the Catholic Church in that region. You know, all of those all of those things, and sort of borrowed borrowed them, and you know, wrote Hooventude from there. Tell us a little bit, just real quick, about the premise of Hooventude. So Hooventude is the story of Mercedes Martinez. That's the narrator, and we meet her when she's 15. So it's very much a coming of age story and a love story. She, uh, the opening of the book, she falls in love with uh, Manuel, 
this very impassioned social justice activist. He's involved with a group, a uh, Catholic youth group. It's speaking out for peace called uh, La Maria Juventud. And uh, unfortunately, this makes Manuel and his group a target for guerrillas and paramilitaries and different factions in Colombia in 1999 who are really clashing and really aren't, aren't happy with anyone who's, <laughs> who's speaking out. And it certainly does not make him a favorite uh, in the eyes of Diego, Mercedes' father, who is a sugarcane plantation owner. He is determined that Mercedes leave Colombia and go to school in the U.S., and get out, and she doesn't want to go. And <laughs> without giving too much away, I guess she uh, some so she she stays. She uh, is involved with the gets more and more involved with the uh, youth group, and several tragic events occur. And she is forced to flee and make some very one might say hasty choices that are definitely a point of no return in her life. But she does return when she's an adult, and that happens in part two of the book, um, which is a bit of a thinner narrat narrative as compared to the, the first half of the book. But um, you do see, I guess, in a very Greek way, her going back <laughs> to, to confront some people in her past and her father about the events that happen. And the book is very much about, uh, and this ties into the title as well, uh, in youth, how we tend to see things very black and white. It's very difficult for us to see the, the nuances and the shades of gray in a situation. And so, you know, at, at 16, she um, it wasn't possible for Mercedes to really understand the full sociopolitical context that the events of her life were taking place. And, and so, but she does see it as an adult going back and you know, her uh, viewpoint is forever changed. Very, very good. Very good. <laughs> so it might have been a little bit long, but it's hard to encapsulate this book. You did go. a wonderful job. <laughs> um, um, one of the things that I want to ask is, was it difficult to structure a narrative around a character whose fundamental definition is how they change? And so you, she goes from seeing things very black and white to seeing things a little bit more uh, maturely, perhaps. Um, mm -hmm. Tell me about what it was like to, to structure the novel. As, and do you see her as like two different characters? As, do you have young Mercedes and old Mercedes? Or what are your thoughts? Oh, absolutely. I definitely do now. And that was certainly one of the um, biggest challenges in crafting this book and it took many many revisions I want to say that I probably made 10 10 to 12 pretty significant revisions on this novel and and it really was difficult to envision how this impacted her life um, which was is very much a big part of the book resolving itself is how okay so you know this certain tragic event occurs um, how does it haunt her in her future uh, relationships and family friendships? Um, what does that mean for her? What she decides to do for her career? I really think if you, the Mercedes we meet at the very beginning is very childlike. And even just from there until the end of part one, she is very much more a young woman when she leaves. And that all happens in the span of five or six months. I mean, when we meet her, uh, initially she has, she mentions having a dream of becoming a flight attendant, which is, <laughs> you know, that there are several reasons I, I chose that as her this sort of whim she has about her future. She has an aunt who was a flight attendant. So she sees it as this sort of glamorous job. And so that is partly um, a bit of a, a childlike, projection for herself, but it is also rooted in in the actual, and that uh, in Latin America, as in a lot of developing countries, working for big hotel chains or airlines, even for, for those who've gone on to get a university education, those are good jobs, and those are certainly jobs where once she learns English, bilingual, you know, bilingualism is desired. I guess it won't be too surprising that to tell people that she doesn't become a flight attendant. <laughs> you know, that, that, that little, that's not too much of a spoiler. Um, she doesn't become a flight attendant in her adulthood, but seeing how, you know, part, part of that growth and, you know, how she, how she changes so much really radically from the, 
she let's just say she's not very focused on her studies when we meet her and she's involved with the youth group and she kind of radically does a 180 I think when she comes to the U.S. <laughs> very cool yeah so I'm very interested and I'm, I'm really interested in how we are compelled to tell stories and how stories are told through us and I'm just curious with the way that she changed Did that all go according to your plan? Or do you feel at some point that the character took matters into her own hands? I mean, how hard was it to to retain the type of control on her that you wanted or needed? That's a good question in terms of the sort of energy that Mercedes has Mm -hmm. on the page. Um, I think she was kind of medium, I want to say, because (laughs) there are some characters who arrive on the page. Um, And one example is the character of Uncle Charlie, who's this sort of nefarious character shows up about a third of the way through the book. He was very, I mean, he just lit, literally lit up the room and he was a real st- scene stealer. But Mercedes was a bit a bit more in the middle. I didn't have too much trouble. I guess there were certain, certain things I knew plot-wise, uh, points that I knew she'd get to. And once I figured out how to give her more agency, and I think that's that's something that's very slippery with a younger ca- character or young pro- protagonist, just giving them agency. There's more limitations in their lives. Um, just dealing with a character who can't drive. I mean, it becomes logistical. It's like, well, how do you get her from point A to point B? I mean, she's got a driver, so she's going to depend on him. R- but really making her more active, um, that did take take some work but once I once I got her there she did a fairly good job of making making decisions for herself and propelling herself along but no that did take you know I'm trying to think of how many drafts in um, because she she was a bit too passive and perhaps childlike initially and, and remained that way for too long and I needed her to to mature a little bit more quickly And as a writer, I think that's something that a lot of newer writers, especially in a longer um, novel structure, struggle with is having a passive character because sometimes how we view our own lives and so it's how we write our own characters Mm -hmm. is completely Mm -hmm. reactionary to what's going on around them. And what makes for an interesting story is that agency. So that's really cool to hear how that came about. How did it? Yeah. And it was it was tricky because, again, especially when you have a younger character and then you do have a lot of strong older characters, both, you know, her first love is a bit older. He's 21. So she's kind of hanging with the older crowd (laughs) a little bit in terms of the youth. But then, you know, the, the, um, the adult characters are, are uh, adult. And um, so they naturally had more power just in terms of getting themselves around, like I said, versus a a young girl who, can't drive. Yeah, <laughs> and I know, yeah. you know you don't necessarily think of those things starting out, but it's it can be it can be tricky things like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. I hate it when people ask writers like, "Where do you get your ideas?" because it's like, "Oh, my head, of course." Um, <laughs> but was <No>. there <laughs> was there anything in particular that compelled you um, to create this story of all stories? Oh, very much so. This story has uh, quite a clear clearly defined a story behind the story uh, impetus. And that is that when I was in college in Florida, uh, I was hanging out with a bunch of young women um, talking one night over drinks, probably (laughs) about our first loves and our first sexual experiences as young women will do. And the one student said, my first love was killed. And he, we were out at a nightclub one night in Colombia, and some a masked gunman came up and shot him point blank on the dance floor, and he died in my arms. And I was at 16 years old, and so of course, yes, we're oh all these women. <laughs> we all, we all are just sitting there with our jaws dropped, saying, and "What?" Then she went on to say, which was even more riveting um, and bizarre. She said, I, I'll never really know for sure, but I think my father might have had something to do with it because my father didn't care for this guy. Again, a father who was wanting her, his daughter to get out and go to boarding school and she didn't want to go. And so I just became so fascinated by that. And those dramatic questions we have, how does this shape your life? I mean, literally just that a tragic event happening in front of you, a violent, sudden murder. But then 
and you think your father somehow was involved? You know, uh, how do you go on to have, what kind of a relationship with your father do you have after that, if at all? And then, you know, it's so interesting that um, just yesterday, and I'm sure this is will be archived on NPR's site, um, Pablo Escobar's son was being interviewed last night on NPR and, and just talking about this, you know, that's very much the dramatic question of, I think he has a documentary out about his life and, and his relationship with his father, which was, he was, had a warm, in many aspects, you know, Pablo Escobar was a very warm, fa- attentive father, yet he did terrible, terrible things, um, including, uh, you know, bombing a plane of, I think there were a hundred civilians on a, a plane at one point and brought this plane down. So, you know, how do you reconcile that in your mind, this family member who toured you is warm and loving, but who also is capable of really horrendous acts. You know, I, I, I just, I find that entirely fascinating. And I can't say that I've answered that question. <laughs> I was just in a conversation with someone about this last night about the book. I said, you know, I pose these dramatic questions. I can't say in all the drafts that I did that I've necessarily answered them. They're raised. And, but I was listening to that interview and I was, I was thinking, I'm still just as fascinated by this <laughs> as when, I set out to write the book, which is which is what you need to carry you through the writing of a, of a it book. It is. It is. That's a great quality in a writer is an endless fascination and an, oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> yeah, no, it's just utterly fascinating to me. Characters like that who are, where there is such moral ambiguity, especially once I started and or once anyone starts taking a closer look at Columbia and all the different factions and how things are tied together and you know, a lot of these men, such as Escobar, really thought they were doing, you know, they were kind of like, just in their minds, just doing what they needed to do to survive or to get their families through this very, you know, tricky situation with, (laughs) with guerrillas and paramilitaries and, you know, then the, and the cocaine, which, you know, they, um, often traffickers won't even do cocaine. It's, there's but there's a western there's an american demand for it so and so th- that also very much uh drove me to write this in a sort of blood diamond way um i you know have done my share of things in the past but cocaine was not one of them <laughs> but yeah. i've certainly been around other people who have been uh you know into that into that substance and you know, been fascinated by uh, just what part unknowingly people are playing in this whole situation in the choices that they're making and as in Blood Diamond without even really knowing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, that's incredible. Is that one of the messages that you hope or one of the things that you hope people take away from your book? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, that is definitely one of them. Um, I mean, certainly uh, not that I think, you know, I've written this book with any kind of preachy. I don't think yeah. it has a preachy quality. I, <laughs> no. I mean, I think if anything, it's opposite. It's I, My aim was to render it as vividly as possible so you would not even think about something like that and, yeah. and except just really see it for what it is. The, the world of Colombia and that link of what's going on south of the border to North America um, and really Mercedes as a global citizen of today. You know, I, I did very much want to shed light on what what it is to be um, a millennial today um, because she is. Mercedes is solidly a millennial where I am actually not. <laughs> I'm a few years past well, maybe just on the cusp. I think I'm technically just on the cusp. I was born in 79. So, uh, but, but Mercedes is a little bit younger. Um, and, and that fascinated me because I have so many friends who, who are, who do have a foot in, in two cultures and sometimes two very different cultures. So Mercedes' father is a cradle Catholic Colombian um, with a very checkered past. And her mother is uh, a Jewish American woman who um, later on you find out in the novel she's relocated to Israel and Mercedes, there's a whole chapter um, on Israel, which was really fun and another challenge to write. (laughs) But I really wanted that tie. I wanted that both in the micro level of Mercedes as a character having this complex identity, but then to also bring in the parallels, maybe not so subtly, probably more overtly, between um, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the Colombian conflict and, and just what that looks like. Lovely. 
Oh, and, and what a, um, I don't want to say like what an ambitious take that <laughs> makes, but seriously, that's so, that's so cool. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I, I knew it was ambitious. And, you know, if you're going to write a novel, I figured that the, you know, the more, again, you have to, you have to keep yourself engaged the whole time too. So, you know, I knew I had to touch on Catholicism. Um, and then I thought, well, if the mother is from American and she's from South Florida, you know, wouldn't that be interesting if she was Jewish? And that takes Mercedes along a different path. So so that's really interesting to me is before this, you had written short stories. This is your first novel. Did mm-hmm. this start off as a short story or was this intended to be a novel all along? It did start off as a short story. So, so uh, after, and I didn't attempt writing it um, in probably, it was probably six or seven solid years after the idea was first planted in my brain and those dramatic questions after hearing that conversation the one night with, you know, this young woman also wasn't, was more of a, just an acquaintance in college. I don't even really remember anything more about her. It was just kind of a, one of those random college events where you're with a, yeah. you're with a, a random selection of people. So, um, so I, I don't, I'm not in touch with her. I don't, I don't remember. I don't have no idea what happened, what became of her, but, um, she, so I wrote the story in the very first semester of my MFA studies and my professor at the time had an exchange where um, p- having the possibility for a novel just because of the backdrop and the fact that this is a war-torn country, there's a lot to work with here. The characters were interesting and I was like, oh, a novel, I don't know. And, I don't know if I can even fathom that right now. Here I was just trying to to get better at fiction. And so I very wisely set it aside. But I do remember asking him, well, how do I know it's if it's a novel versus a story? And it was a fat short story. I mean, you're talking 30 pages. It was getting very unwieldy. And he said, well, a couple of things. You know, you have to, you have to be obsessed enough with the subject matter to keep your interest in it, as I've mentioned before. But he, and he also said the the questions have to have enough of a dramatic thrust versus in a short story. So I didn't pick it up again for another three years, I think. So that's a lot of percolation. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I am a big believer that the subconscious does a lot of work. And the more the more you can get that to work for you on its own, the better. <laughs> Trust the subconscious. <laughs> Sometimes I call that letting a story stew. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is that kind of what you felt you were doing in that Oh, time? absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also just buying time, knowing that I was bettering my skills. And so uh, the story was ready, I guess, when my skills were ready. When all, all of that sort of fell into place, I graduated and I was, you know, for about the, the next six months or year post-graduation, I was... I had worked on short stories for my thesis, so I was still, those were still in my brain, and I was still polishing and revising them and starting to send them out, of course, which is a whole job in and of itself. Um, and, but finally, and it was also one of those life moments because I, was, I had just turned 30, and so it was one of those, oh, my God, I'm 30, and where's my novel? I was supposed <laughs> to have written a novel by now. Am I going to do this, you know? Um, and so it still took me, I think, another month. I didn't start it till that September, but I got to it. It was like, this is it, like September 1st, rolled around and sat down, like, you write your novel now. That's awesome. <laughs> so, you know, there's nothing like that fear of life passing by with regret and death looming over your shoulder that you don't, you know, yeah. <laughs> to, get oh, yeah. to, to put your money where your mouth is and, and write a book. So it was always kind of an expectation of yourself that you would write a novel. Yeah, I know. I definitely had those fantasies from the time I was, I guess, really in like fourth or fifth grade when I was reading, you know, Judy Bloom books and the chapter books that we all sort of start off with. And of course, those are the first novels that you mm-hmm. <laughs> come across. Little do you know how difficult it is if you once you're an adult and you get into literary fiction, the task that you have before you, um, 
but yeah, no, I, I always wanted to, to take on that challenge and really in writing it, it was one of the greatest joys of my life working on this, this book for sure. Absolutely. Good. I think that shines through. I always think that you can tell, um, you can tell when a writer is having fun, you can tell when the writer is interested in oh, crafting yeah. the story and that definitely comes through with your work. So, well, yeah, well, thank you. And yeah. I, I agree. I am a big believer in that Robert Frost saying, saying, which is, you know, no tears for the writer, no tears for the reader, no, t- you know, no laughter for the writer, you know, on and on. I think it, it does definitely come through on the page. Yeah. And that circles back so nicely with what you said at the very beginning about transmitting what you were thinking and feeling uh, through this book to your readers and just kind of the magic that happens there, that almost telepathy kind of thing. So. Yeah, I like to think of it as telepathy. <laughs> I mean, in that way, again, uh, since we're all staring down death one day, it is a way of that we as human beings have of beating death. One of the only ways I think is writing some lasting stories, be they fiction or nonfiction or whatever form they take. And then you can feel like you're sitting down and with Hemingway or with, you know, various other, with Aristotle, with anyone. And you're having a moment in space and time. And that, that to me is truly magic. Was it difficult writing about Columbia when you had never been there? Yes and no. Um, again, because, because I lived in Costa Rica and got to meet more Colombians in Costa Rica because there's a huge uh, community there of you know, citizens, people who are now Costa Rican who were Colombian who left with their families in the 70s, 80s, and 90s and fled to neighboring countries. Our landlady was Colombian um, in Costa Rica. And so, you know, I heard more stories. And certainly with the internet these days, too, I think that's really such a saving grace of the fiction writer today. So so between these, these couple different avenues, that was how I felt I gained my confidence and my ability to write this book. Um, maybe not just confidence, I mean, the actual ability to, to write it, uh, when you can put yourself down in Google Earth, in a street, in, you know, in this square, the Plaza Caicedo, which features in the book quite a bit in downtown Columbia, and see everything that's around there, and see, oh, there's a Banco de Bogota on the corner, there, you know, you can use that in your, in your work, and I also you know, used YouTube quite a bit because thankfully 1999, I mean, there is when the internet was just really, you know, coming into being and there, there were, uh, videos, handheld camera footage of that people in marches, peace marches had taken of that time. So you can very much put yourself right there by watching this footage and I wrote down names of the signs people were carrying and what what kinds of people were there, what they were wearing, uh, you know, all of those things really helped me um, create those moments in the book of the rallies and, and so forth and I think really accurately um, and yeah, what, you know, thank goodness for those things. But it, but it wasn't, you know, it could have been more challenging and certainly there was a lot of research too that ended up getting cut that must As, be painful. It's, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes you really think you can hang on to things, and but no, they just have to go. <laughs> sometimes you can repurpose things, and other times you can't. So you just have to accept it. Now that you've finished and published one novel, thoughts on doing a second one or additional novels? Or is there anything else that you're looking forward to moving on to, a new challenge? New challenges. There are several, um, and I hesitate to call them new because I feel like they're back burner challenges. <laughs> um, I am not a writer who's ever short of ideas or inspiration. Um, when my floodgates are open, I mean, right now they're pretty much closed because I'm putting all of my creative energy into promoting the book, um, which I do enjoy. I love to speaking with people at book festivals and panels and all that sort of thing. Um, I have uh, stories that are a set of stories that are Italian American and historical that are inspired from uh, my mother's side of the family, family history, um, that I think I might pursue a Fulbright to go finish. Um, that is sort of at war, that impulse is sort of in conflict with the uh, desire and the vision that I've had for a couple of years now 
to write a futuristic work set in Florida and a Florida of the future, which I think, you know, having lived down here for so long, I'm, I'm quite a passionate Floridian. I love warm climates. I love the subtropics. <laughs> um, but I, you know, I'm, I'm really just so curious and obsessed with, you know, what is the state going to look like in 40 or 50 years when we have a population of, you know, a dozen, dozen million more people and when the seas are going to be rising and the aquifer, you know, we're very much dependent on our Florida aquifer for our water and all of these sorts of issues. And I think I definitely have, I sense that I have enough of an obsession about that. I'm not sure exactly what the plot would be for that, but I would just trust that I would, you know, build the world and the story will come. If you build it, the story will yeah. come. <laughs> and, and then, you know, I also miss writing short stories and to get my feet back in the fictional water, I think it would be good for me to just write a few short stories. And really, probably my next book that comes out, I, I've published probably 40 or 50 short stories. So it will probably be another collection of stories that are already done that I would just be polishing and no, no promises, nothing set in stone yet, but hint, hint, that might be coming out in the next, you know, year or two. Very cool. Well, I and probably my listeners will be very much looking forward to experiencing that along with you through your writing telepathy, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh. thank you so very much. And it, this has been such a pleasure to speak with you on your show. Oh, thank, thank you. you so much, Vanessa. It's just, it has been a pleasure. So thank you. Mm-hmm.